Welcome to the Press Toward the Goal podcast. Today I'm joined by a cricketer who was identified as a real talent early on as a youngster, but has still had to work his butt off and overcome a number of challenges to get to where he is now as a fixture for the Brisbane Heat and Queensland Bulls. James Baisley, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Jase. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for the, the nice intro there as well. Yeah, fair a fair summation, do you think? Yeah, I'll take that, mate. I thought that was well said. Yeah, very good. Because obviously we'll get into it a little bit later, but you, you were a player who come through the kind of pathways program and then had a few setbacks and you've really had to work your butt off to, to get to the place where you are now. Yeah, that's exactly right, mate. There's a, there's a bit of a journey to it. Um, but I guess that's, that's like everyone, everyone's got their own story, their own journey. So, um, I look forward to unpacking it a bit with you later on. Yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing a bit more about it as well. Uh, first of all, though, before we get started, we like to start by allowing our listeners to learn a little bit more about the man, James Baisley, not not necessarily the cricketer, but the man, yep. James Baisley. So I'll just shoot a couple of rapid fire questions at you if you're happy to get going. Yeah, mate. Don't know what's coming here. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing too curly, I don't think. Uh, first one, pretty just simple. Apple or Android man? I'm um, an Apple man. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Apple man, but we, we probably should preface that by saying you have had a few issues with your Mac tonight, so any yeah, chance yeah. of that changing? No, I don't think it'll change just because I'm, I probably I just don't know enough about it. to, to I'm not really into the tech stuff too much, so I just Fair stick enough. to the road, but yeah, I'm on my wife's Mac as we speak, so who yeah. knows? <laughs> we'll get through, I'm sure. What's something yeah. that you eat or drink too much of? Um, oh, mate, I eat a lot of everything, uh, put it that <laughs> way. So we could probably list a few things, but um, I tried to drink less coffee in the winter. I'm not a big coffee drinker, as in, I'll probably only have one a day. Tops, yeah, but I tried decent. to like, I tried to like see what it was like going without it, and I really struggled. So it's fair to say I really love a, a good morning coffee waking up. Yeah, I think that one's probably less than most people. So certainly Yeah, one or two. It's less, but, you know, it's kind of like I feel like I couldn't really go without it. So it's probably a little bit of a hook there. Fair enough. Uh, what's the most used app on your phone? Oh, mate, it'd probably have to be... Oh, geez. Um, Spotify would be up there, I reckon, like driving to training every day, listening to music or listening to podcasts. Spotify will get a good run. Yep. Um, cricket season, the cricket app's getting a decent run. And then you obviously got your socials, which, uh, you know, I don't spend a heap of time on, but they'd be up there as well. But say Spotify takes the cake. Yeah. What What do you listen to on Spotify? What's the tune of choice um, for James Baisley? Yeah, mate, a bit of everything. Uh, I, stay away, I stay away from your heavy metal, um, kind of. Stay away from your heavy metal screamo kind of business. Um, but like, don't mind delving into a bit of rap, hip hop. Um, you know, I'll go back 80s, 90s. I'm a bit of everything otherwise, but stay away from the, the heavy, heavy stuff. Yeah. Um, give give every, everything else a bit of a, a whirl. Very nice. What's something you can't leave the house without? Something I can't leave my house without is probably my water bottle. Oh, true. It's just a bit of a, I mean, it's a bit of a stupid one. It's not great there, but like I, I'm usually always just taking my water bottle with me. Um, so I'm probably going to go with that. Yeah, nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you've got to keep hydrated, especially. Yeah, that's yeah. it, absolutely. <laughs> Who was your cricketing hero growing up? It was probably firstly Adam Gilchrist. Um, I was actually, funny enough, a keeper growing up. Wow. When I was younger, younger, I, I could bowl, but I just loved keeping. Um, so I loved Gilly. I had the orange gloves, uh, the orange Puma gloves. I had the Puma classic bat. And I loved how he went about his batting um, and keeping at the time. So he was probably my first one, yep. I would say. Yeah, well, uh, cricketers are well known for being absolute tragics for their sport. And some non-cricket <laughs> lovers would probably say that they're obsession with the game's a bit sick. 
Uh, do you have a specific piece of cricket memorabilia or equipment, uh, equipment which you could never part with? Um, yeah, it's probably an Adam Gilchrist sign bat, actually. Oh, nice. I it, so I had, I had an Adam Gilchrist sign Puma bat, similar to when I loved Gilly. So I probably... That's that's something that comes to mind. It sits at it sits at mum's and dad mum and dad's house now still, and um, it brings back a lot of memories looking at it. But nothing really else, Jay. So I reckon that would be the one thing that I always held on to. Yep. Um, was my Puma Adam Gilchrist signed bat. And did you get that personally signed yourself? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Good deal, Very yeah. good. Yeah. I oh, know. Obviously. You're, you're the guy getting the, the autographs asked of you now, but I remember when I was a young fella getting the, a huge thrill of approaching the cricketers, you know, after the yeah. end of the day's play or something and fond memories of doing that myself. Yeah, no, it is. It, it's nice to actually be able to spend time with the fans and, and be on the other side of that in a way as well. It's actually very, very rewarding and it's a cool part of what we do. Yeah, awesome. So I, I guess that we'll, we will we've kind of touched there on your, your early life as a youngster, obviously a big cricket mm. fan. Uh, what role did sport play in your life growing up on the Sunshine Coast? Yeah, it played a big role in my life. Um, my dad was great. He played a lot of cricket, um, played a lot of rugby league, tennis, golf. Mum was a dancer, ballerina, ballerina teach, wow. ballet teacher. Like, so she was really active as well. Um, my sister Renee was sporty and my brother Trent was sporty, both older. So having a lot of examples in the family of, you know, getting outside, playing sport, obviously someone to play with. We put, we played yeah. with each other, you know what I mean? Everyone was keen for something um, sport related or outside related um, or activity related, you know, around our house. So it wasn't hard um, to, you know, say no to, to playing sport. And then I think as I, I got older and really found that love for cricket, probably into the, in the primary school kind of ranks, but loved playing all sports at, at school. Um, and then, you know, as, as you probably have heard before, like you get, you know, a bit older, get into high school and you kind of make a choice of, of going down the line of just, of just one sport, which for me was cricket, but it was a massive role for me sporting wise um, with my friends, my family, my cousins, um, you know, posters on the wall, what magazines you're reading, what books you're reading. Like for me, it was, was just all sports. So it was a massive role. Yeah. You referred there to, to choosing cricket and that being the path you went down. Were there other sports which you sort of seriously contemplated? Yeah, it was basic cricket and golf for me um, when I was about 14. Um, you know, I was, I was in the, the pathways for either. So it was kind of cricket in summer, golf in winter. And when I played cricket in summer, I wanted to be a cricketer. And then even when I played golf in winter, I thought, you know what, maybe I'm going to go down the, the golf path. But I think cricket always had the lead. Um, I liked the team aspect of cricket a little bit more than the individuality of, of golf. And um I'm glad I made that choice back then. I, I don't think I, I would have turned out to be uh, a superstar at golf, I guess. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was probably between those two that I was pursuing pretty hard through that, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 year old kind of stage. Yep. Yeah. Mm. So, so referring to the junior, junior cricket, were you always, I, I, my understanding is that you were always kind of earmarked for the representative teams from quite a young age. Yeah, I was always good, but I, I wasn't always the best. Um, you know what I mean? Like I was always good enough to play Sunshine Coast region and school boys. And um, I played under 12 Queensland's, but I didn't make under 15 Queensland. I missed out on that. Um and then I got back into the, the Queensland pathway when I was, you know, 17. So I did some time just in the, you know, in the local comp competition playing for Marucha, I guess, and playing yep. just for Sunshine Coast. Um, so I, I was always a good cricketer in terms of those rep teams, but I was never, never the best in my age group. Well, yeah. you know, not, not even the best. I was never even the best five or six kind of in my age group. I was kind of sitting in after that. So I had to work hard for it. So it all started at Maroochydore Cricket Club? 
Definitely, yeah. Down under yeah. 10s, Friday nights, um, softball, kind of, you know, how it works. You'll get 18 balls or whatever. We've got 12 balls each or something. I don't know how many you face, but I'd always face them and then kick up a stink that I wouldn't face anymore. <laughs> and I just want to keep the whole time and not rotate around different fielding positions. So that's where it started for me. It was a great club. Dad played there. He had a big part of it. He was president for a few years and that was a really good cricket club to grow up learning around the game. Yeah, well, so you were in Queensland under 12s. You you didn't make the 15s. Then you were into the under 17s, under 19s, and you had a good carnival at the under 19s, if I understand correctly. Yeah, I had a good carnival 19s, then got into a, a list of 30 players, kind of for Australian under 19s, and then that got cut for 15, and I made that, which was then the World Cup squad. So we went from that 19s carnival playing for Queensland to a couple of months later um, playing the World Cup in Dubai. And we actually went to Sri Lanka first, played three games in Sri Lanka and then played the World Cup in Dubai and, and lost in the semi final. So I was a part of that team. I actually played every game uh, and that was amazing. Um, it was a goal that I wrote down and, and, and aimed for uh, probably a year and a half, two years before, or, you know, playing that Queensland carnival was, was saying I want to play for Australia at the next world cup. And um, to have a good under 19s carnival and saying that it wasn't amazing. Um, I just did a bold quite consistently. And I just did a couple of special things with the bat that really caught their eye. And then they really, they really thought it was, you know, nice for them to, have someone you know with some some power in terms of their batting in that all round all round a kind of spot in their team that they picked me and off we went and and that was a really fun fun time in my life yeah uh, real taste of you know what this whole being a professional sportsman's kind of like um and i loved it yep so you mentioned you played every game you were the second leading wicket taker for australia and also scored an unbeaten half century in one of the matches as well what was that yeah. whole experience like? You know, was that your first taste of foreign conditions? Yeah, um, yeah, it was. It definitely was. But as I said before, it was a real taste of what being a professional is like. And it's a credit to, I guess, the 19s program or, you know, the World Cup. This is they ran it so professionally, um, you know, to the, the jerseys that we were wearing, to, you know, the, the grounds over there and, just everything is run exactly like it would do almost for, you know, the men's world cup, you know, we got drug tested, um, the accommodation, the team meetings, it was just all a real taste of, you know, what it takes and what it looks like. Obviously the games are on TV, um, they're international stadiums on TV, etc. cetera. Um, media interviews all stuff like that that you're not used to getting a real taste of the whole thing it was incredible um and as i said before i loved it and, and i played good cricket which was nice uh, as well in the, in the tournament yeah so you came back from there you got a uh, rookie contract with the bulls i understand yeah yeah you... yeah came back yeah sorry yeah, yeah. you go uh, you came back and got a rookie contract. That would have been, well, the World Cup was 2014, January. So, you know, I would have got a rookie contract, turned 20 years old, um, turned, turned 20 years old in April. And then I basically, I was living on the sunny coast um, and I thought, well, I need to try and actually get to Brisbane here. Um, so I moved down to Brisbane in June. I actually spent a few months there at the Korea Australia Academy um june july training there so i was put up in a unit in spring hill and then moved in with a good mate manus um who i played cricket with 17s and 19s with the basket mate said mate can i come and live with you and your family and he was he was up for it uh, basically just said you know what are your thoughts on it and he's like yeah i'll ask mum and dad it was casual but and it just yeah. turned out and then that was amazing so i went from spring hill unit into training full-time with the bulls as a rookie and living with um you know, now my best mate and, uh, you know, a fellow a professional cricketer as well. So that was, that was a cool transition. Yeah. So, so what, what was that like? You'd been on the pathways for Queensland cricket. You, you come out of a successful world cup under 19 level, you go on the bulls contract list. Were you just thinking, how good is this? How easy is this? I've made it. Yeah. There's an element to 
to you know that that um is there um that feeling of yeah i've made it um how good's this um you know what can go wrong or, or whatever there was definitely it was just surreal a little bit and it was definitely my dream um to get there and i guess it happened pretty quick in that space of six months from going you know 19s oz 19s to the bulls contracted you know two-year rookie contract so it happened nice and quick um and i suppose that yeah yeah you get caught up in it of, of that feeling as you said jason of like just yeah going how good's this what could go wrong or you know how good am i um and then yeah you get on the journey of of being a sportsman and I guess the ups and downs that then come. Yeah. You had, a, you had a few, a few downs like there initially, didn't you? I think that um, suffered a few injuries, things didn't really go to plan how you, you would have hoped that they would have turned out. Mm. Yeah. Well, our first year on that rookie contract, I basically had a back stress fracture, which was probably um, going to come just, I played a lot of cricket the year before. Um, so I got a back stress, stress fracture. So that first rookie year, I didn't play a heap of cricket. Second year, um, actually played a really good year of cricket, played really well. Um, and then got, ended up getting upgraded. So my second year on rookie, I got upgraded and signed a new, new two year, two year contract, but upgraded to the full contract senior list, um, had a really good year. So they upgraded me and I would have been 21 um or 22 so i got upgraded um which was nice and then from there had a couple of injuries again those two years didn't play very well um didn't quite make the most of opportunities along with a lot of other things and then basically got um delisted at the end of that that two-year contract list that would have been 23 i think when i got delisted so that's long story short we can obviously go into more there if you want but that's kind of how it happened. Yeah. Uh, what What does that do to your psyche? Like, I mean, what, what does that do to you as a person? Obviously, you've been on a big high. You think you, you're you going on this journey, going to be a professional cricketer. I imagine 10 years, 15 years, you, you, you've, you're you in there now. What does that do to, to a man when you, you kind of almost spat out of the system? And I've heard that it can be quite yeah. brutal sometimes. Yeah, it definitely can be brutal. Um, I think for me, um, I guess I was in there for four years. Um, by the end of it, I was, yeah, I didn't know, uh, I guess, I, what kind of cricketer I wanted to be. Um, you know, I was changing a lot um, technique-wise, not totally knowing, you know, almost lo losing what my strengths were or just not knowing how I wanted to play. Um, and that happens in the system as a young player when, you know, a lot of people, are, a lot of different people or, you know, they might be coaches or mentors or, you know, senior players or senior players in your club team are just telling you how to go about it. And, of course, you're going to listen, you know what I mean, as a young player, you're going to listen to those guys who have gone before you and done it and been successful. So you're chopping and changing a lot. So I didn't, I lost, you know, who I was as a cricketer um, and then just started to not enjoy it because I, because of that probably, in that back end of that second contract year, along with some injuries that it just, yeah, it does break it down. It does, um, it does make yeah yeah really flat. Um, it is brutal yeah, in that time of, of your life is brutal um, because it's your dream. It's all you've ever dreamt of. You've had it right there in your hands and then, yeah, you know, it's, it's all gone. And, and as you said, it can be brutal and um, you know, it's very cutthroat industry as well. Usually, yeah, uh, you know, you're gone and not many people come back. So um, that's kind of, it was a rough little time then, but um, looking back now, it was actually the best thing that, that happened. Yeah. You, yeah. You say not many people come back, but, but you mm -hmm. did, we'll get to that shortly, but was there a point where you kind of just thought I'm done with this? I'm just going to throw the towel in. Um. No, not really. Um, so that next year, I just said, I just want to play like, I just, want to, I just want to try and play a whole year of cricket without being injured. Um, so I moved clubs. Um, I might have moved clubs the year before, actually. Anyway, 
um, I was playing at Redlands. It might have only been my second year at Redlands, so quite fresh there, um, which was nice. And I just wanted to play for Redlands the whole year and try not to, try not to have any injuries. You know what I mean? It's just something I hadn't yeah. really achieved for a few years. Um, so there wasn't really a like a, oh, I want to get back in the system or get contracted. It was just like, oh, I just want to try and, you know, play cricket and, and be injury free and, and see what happens. Um, and I managed to do that, which was nice. That first year I just played, I played first year off contract, played injury free all year, which was nice. Had some good games, had some, I didn't have a stellar season, but certainly, um, you know, played well, played well enough here and there um, and was injury free, which was the main result. And then basically looked myself in the mirror after that year and said, are we having another crack at this or not? Um, and kind of decided that we're going to have another crack and um, off we went on that adventure, which is yeah, a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. so you went from training full time with the Bulls squad, the Queensland team, the full professional setup there. And I understand there were times when you were waking up early in the morning, you, you were going to the nets on your own, just training by yourself. So that's a massive change from the kind of regiment and the routine that you would have had in the bull setup. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that, that first year off contract, I was, I was just pretty much just training with, with Redlands twice a week. I wasn't doing a heap of extra stuff. Um, I was doing a little bit here or there, but that second year when um, uh, I went and saw a coach in Sydney, um, I got hooked up with a psychologist, a, a different gym trainer, um, a new manager um, and I quit my job um, and basically said, this is what I'm doing and I'm going all in. And, you know, I just made a lot of changes in that next season. I call it, I call it my wilderness season, um, yep. which was basically, you know, a couple of years in the wilderness, basically saying, I um, get kicked out of professional cricket and then you just, get into the wilderness and you have to fight for yourself. And that's kind of the way I like to shape this season of my life, but basically made, you know, big changes um, in a lot of aspects. And then, yeah, started to, to do things like that. I obviously didn't have a job at that stage. So I was at the nets 6am most mornings or off wow. to the gym, stuff like that. Just doing everything I could. Um, and yeah, that was the start of that journey. Yeah, well, wow. it's pretty inspiring. You know, you really wanted it. You really chased the dream down, and um, and here we are now. But during that time, you you started doing some disability support services work. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I had a really good job um, working in cricket as a cricket coach and writing cricket programs and with some mates, and it was a cracking job. Um, um, so that was really hard to leave that, but I made a decision to leave that job because I was spending so much time in cricket um, that when I got to my own sad days playing cricket, uh, you know, there's probably four or 5%, 6% even there where I'm, you know, I was probably just worn out from cricket during the whole week or, you know, I was giving emotional energy into everyone else's cricket career. And, and at that, every single bit of energy, emotionally, phys physically, you know, needed to go to my cricket if I was going to make it, not anyone else's. So that, that was a decision I made, not an easy one. And, um, but it was a, yeah, a really good decision. And then, yeah, basically, um, uh, a mate reached out who, who had started uh, a disability. He's, he's been in the industry for ages. Um, and we were mates on the sunny coast. He reached out and kind of said, Hey mate, like, um you know if you ever want some some work you know you'd be great you know reach out I'm down in Brisbane now kind of looking for a few people to help me out blah 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 and um yeah the actual timing of like when I quit my job um and you know got that message on Instagram was like within hours which was wow. a very much an answer to prayer um for me which was pretty cool um and so I picked up that and, and just I sat down with with Hayden he, he's the guy who um got me on got me some work and I said look I'm going for cricket you know I need to be flexible and he kind of was just very supportive of that and gave me some shifts here and there and 
um, that worked out really well. And then I did, yeah, I did that for nearly two or three years. I ended up actually picking up my own clients. Um, yeah, wow. Kind of working for myself with it, which was pretty cool by the end of it. But, you know, it wouldn't have been any more than kind of 20, 20 hours a week. Yeah. Um, you know, almost just to get enough money to, to, to live and the rest of the time I was training for cricket. Yeah, so obviously working with disadvantaged people, it sounds like when that came along, you were well on the road to, you know, launching your career again. What did that do for your mindset, you know, seeing the less fortunate people and did it kind of give you a bit of a perspective shift at the same time? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, I think I, uh, man, I, was, I was really focused in that season. You know what I mean? I think if I was working as a disability support worker or working at worse, like, you know, <laughs> I was just focused on cricket and I think it would have worked yeah. out of the way, but it was just a nice job. And it was just, it was a job that I enjoyed um, doing like, and yeah, there certainly is that perspective of, you know, how fortunate you are, but, but as well for me, it was just, you know, also good just to fill some time and still get away from cricket in a way. And, and you can't train every day. Uh, you can't train 10 hours a day, every day, cause you just, you're just going to break and you're going to be exhausted. So just to be able to train and then, you know, go and do a fulfilling, fulfilling job for a bit and then train in the afternoon or something helped me fill my days a bit and give me some, some more purpose. And it's just a nice thing. You're helping people. So it's always fulfilling, certainly for me. Yeah, that's right. And you obviously came through that. And what, what was kind of the, the point where you thought, hey, hold on, we might be on again here, where you could sort of uh, had something happen maybe with the bulls or with the heat or second 11 or something where you thought, oh, we're going back in the right direction, Neil? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was a, it was a second 11 call up. Um, um someone got injured and, and i got caught off of the back of one of the selectors watching me bowl you know that previous sad day and said you know bowl well take him down there and we went off to tassie for a second 11 game i took three wickets first innings four four wickets in the second innings wow. uh, and bowl really nicely um and then you know two weeks later we had another second 11 game and i held my 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 spot in the team and, and bowled pretty well and then got 50 might have got 50 or maybe late 40s. Uh, I batted really well in Adelaide. And then, that, you know, it was kind of a sniff. And then I think, um, and then there might have been one more second 11, Jace, or towards the, you know, back end of the season before COVID hit. Yep. Or it might have just been those two. But then that played, played well for Redlands. And then that was then went into January, February, March. And it was about March that coronavirus hit in 2020. So there was some... So I played well, a couple of good second 11 games in kind of 2019 um, where I think, um, and I did some training with the Bulls as well, where I just said, hey, can I come in? Just, I'll just ring the coach and can I come in and bowl? You know, that everyone, well, you always need net bowlers. Um, yeah. People that people who put their hand up to come in and bowl are never turned away just because it's actually helpful for the, the batters and, and the training sessions as well because there's guys who get injured. So... I was putting my hand up to bowl and then had those two second 11 games. And I guess I was kind of, you know, working my way back in the system a little bit. Um, and I think that's when, you know, the coaches also noticed that, you know, I'd improved a lot um, or got better. So that was cool. Yeah. You, you mentioned there kind of coming out of COVID 2019, 2020, uh, second yeah. 11 games, the end of 2020 and then March 31st, 2021, your Queensland Bulls debut against New South Wales in a 50 over game and your great mate Marnus presented you with your cap. What was that like? Yeah, that was awesome. Um, just one of those things where you kind of, I was like, geez, it'd be cool if, if Marnus presented me my cap, you know, something we talked about and it's like, you know, I nearly almost went and asked the coach, like, hey, mate, can Manus present my cat? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, but I was like, nah, I just trust that I'm, I'm sure it's going to be Manus. And yeah, it was. And I think he uh, he really enjoyed the moment too. Certainly been very invested in, you know, our friendship and also my cricketing journey, you know, as I have, you know, in his as well. So um, that was a great moment, a really cool week that, you know, went from, you know, one day to boot a shield debut to getting married 
um that was that was cool cool week yeah that is that's huge um yeah yeah, so so that was a proper initiation by fire as well it was practically an australian team new south wales Mm. fielded that day wasn't it yeah it was there was stark hazelwood no cummins lyon smith warner um so i was bowling uh we got smashed um but i bowled a few overs at steve smith and he said that my slow ball was pretty cool. So I just remember being chuffed about that. But he started yeah, to like line, he started to line me up after I <laughs> bowled a few balls. He could just tell he was lining me up and then hit me for a few. And I got out second ball to, to Mitchell Stark, but I don't know if you saw it. I actually smacked the pull shot and it was a really good catch on the boundary by Warner. Yeah, right. So I walked off and I was like, geez, I actually hit a great shot off Stark. <laughs> What, what can you do and the coach came straight up to me and was like mate i'm lucky like that was a really nice shot yeah, so that was a, uh yeah a baptism of fire um you know queensland new south wales but you yeah, wouldn't want it any other way yeah that's it and um you got a bulls contract the following year and brisbane heat yeah. really started to um that opened up for you as well with the heat yeah, definitely. Well, I, I played, I debuted for the Heat before I debuted for the Bulls. And I think, okay. you know, play, playing a few games for the Heat that year before um, in, and doing pretty well helped me then get, you know, um, into that that Bulls game that we spoke about and then, you know, into a Bulls contract as well. And then, yeah, I was well and truly back into the system. Um, you know, Bulls contract, Heat contract, you know, last year, 21. So um, that was really cool really really yeah. cool that's awesome and that would just be such a you you i mean you you know modest guy i know but, but what a great kind of um what a what a great kind of um privilege that is after the work that you put in you must have really thought to yourself you know i've, I've really earned this and i guess did it feel better the second time you really felt like yeah. you put in for it yeah way better felt way better mate um no i was very proud of myself very, very proud of myself. Um, and yeah, it felt better that, that second time, I guess, because yeah, not just because you worked for it. I mean, I worked for it the first time as of well. I've always been a hard worker, but yeah, 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 I know what you're saying. Like, you know, that real fulfillment because I went and did it, you know, my way, I guess, as well. I went and worked it out yeah. for myself and I had to do, I had to work it out my way. And as I said before, not everyone kind of comes back and comes back really well. Um, so, I was really proud of that um, and it was actually very helpful to come back and have learned the, all the lessons I learned through that wilderness time for my cricket, for my life, to come back in and, you know, really trust my game, know my game, know what person I am, et cetera, you know, to come into an environment that's, um, you know, cutthroat, polarising, high pressure at times. Um, was I was really thankful for that and that's why I look back now and go, you know, that, that those troubles earlier in my career and that, you know, losing of contract was, was probably, you know, the best thing that happened to me. Yeah. You mentioned you were a different person the second time around as well. And it's mm. obviously still the same journey, but we've kind of yeah, yeah. got two kind of paths there. Um, wh- what did you learn about yourself? Do you think you just had too much pressure on making it as a cricketer in yourself the first time around? Yeah, that's definitely part of that, um, you know, which all, which all young players work, work through um, when they come into the system. I think that, yeah, I was so caught up in it. Um, I was very much, you know, defining myself by, by my cricket, um, defining myself by my performances. And I had to really separate that, you know, coming back into the system. I understood that, you know, cricket didn't define me. You know, I was a human being first. I was a person first. My character, you know, is consistent. Whether I get, you know, five wickets or get smashed for 100 runs or whatever, um, you know, that doesn't define my character or the way I act or talk or carry myself. Um, So separating those two things was really important for me um, to then just, you know, just relax a bit more, I think, and play a bit more, you know, fearlessly and, and just deal with the the failures that come as a cricketer and just be able to let them go and, you know, get up again the next morning or, you know, get up again the next week and have another crack and believe and be confident that you're, you're going to perform well, not, not carry, you know, this, you know, I guess disappointment or whatever that can come from not playing well. 
if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. Just what, just one more thing before we move on to a couple of listener questions. Um, you're, mm. you're obviously an all-rounder, hard-hitting batsman, a bowler as well, and you've talked a lot about working on your game. How do you kind of find the balance there between what what, what is maybe a, a more dominant aspect of your yeah. game, or how, how do you work that out? I'm still working that out, I think. Um, that's not easy, like you think as an all-rounder. Yeah. Your sweet spot's kind of playing every game, and, you know, it's almost in every single game you expect to get all these runs and you expect to get all these wickets, you know what I mean? And that's kind of what you expect of yourself almost every game as an all rounder, because you've got such a both, we've got such a, you know, opportunity to contribute with both, both disciplines. Yeah. So that in itself is a lesson to learn. You know, if you just look at this game, I just played this week where I bowled really well, but I got a duck, you know what I mean? And it's like some, you can walk away that and go, I didn't have a great game because I, you know, didn't get any runs, but my bowling was so good that like, you know, you need to hold on to that and go, yeah, no, my bowling was awesome. Um, my batting, you know, I just got a good ball or whatever, or, you know, just didn't get any runs this week, but, you know, I'm doing all the right things. So that's going to come as well. You know what I mean? So you got to be careful how you, I guess, judge yourself or how you analyze your performances because you got so much going on with both um, that you're always batting, you're always bowling. It's easy to kind of look at the, 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 the days it didn't work out um, and be hard on yourself. But in terms of training, I think I've learned how to balance them pretty well, um, you know, now in um, some days, you know, I'm just focusing on batting. Some other days I'm just focusing on bowling um, and other days I'm focusing on, on both. So yep. that's, you know, that's for the player, you know, to learn their own method there. But for me, it's mixing it up a little bit and, and just always looking to try and contribute to, the team with battle ball when I get a chance. Yeah, you just mentioned the the match you've just completed. I think it's fair to say you could, took a decent catch there as well. So we'll give you a, yeah, a tick yeah. for fielding as well. <laughs> tick for fielding. That's two out of three. That's a good point. <laughs> you take, take that, that, I reckon. Yeah, yeah two out got of three. A, yeah, that's pretty good. Got a couple of list, listener questions which have come in on Instagram or press toward mm -hmm. the goal on Instagram. The first one is from Lachlan Hackles, who are So we got a couple of listener questions for you now, James. And the first one comes from Lachlan underscore Hackles on Instagram, who asks, <laughs> what do you think about the increase in popularity of limited overs formats over traditional long form or test cricket? Do you think oh, test wow. cricket is the most pure form of the game? Wow. Quite nice in question, depth. And, th and that's his real name as well. <laughs> Nice question, Locke. Um, yeah, Test cricket's definitely still the most purest. Um, it's got to be. Um, it's the best. So it is. It's just, you know, it's just, it's more just the opportunities and the different leagues that are, you know, coming from T20 cricket that I guess, you know, catch more media or, or it's just the franchise model of T20 cricket. It's very marketable and attractive yeah. and, you know, and, and highly paid, I guess, for athletes. So there's just a lot more opportunities in that. So there's going to be more players in that, more players in the league. And, but ultimately, they're, they're probably players that, you know, might not be good enough for test cricket or might not have the game for test cricket. But um, test cricket, you know, there's only one Australian test cricket team, um, you know, whereas you can play T20 cricket, you know, for multiple different teams around the world in different franchise leagues. So that's kind of the reason for that but test cricket's still the most purest form Lockie so keep aiming for that the baggy green yeah <laughs> uh second last or well, the last one we got is from Danny Cop, also on Instagram who's the scariest bowler you've faced and what goes <laughs> through your head when they're running in um this there's a few scary bowlers out there I guess some fast bowlers um I probably go back to facing Kagiso Rabada from South Africa when I was quite young in a like a Cricket Australia 11 team so I wasn't as good of a batter as I am now um and that was pretty that was pretty daunting I remember um and in terms of when they're when they're running in um well you're actually just yeah thinking about watching the ball I mean you're, you're trying to when you go out to bat you're trying to 
you know, get yourself in that that zone. You're trying to stay in the present. You're not trying to worry about, you know, where they're going to bowl or predict where they're going to bowl or worry about, you know, the outcome of, of the delivery. You're just going to try and stay really present and, and actually watch the ball and trust your practice that you're able just to see the ball and then react uh, in the right way. That's all you can control as a batter. You can't control where the ball is going to be. So um, if you get too caught up in that, then it gets, you know, even scarier and you probably won't lay a bat on it. <laughs> 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 yeah, thanks. I'm sure Lockie and uh, Daniel appreciate you answering those questions. You did kind no of worries. mention, you touched there in the response to Lockie's question about the various T20 leagues around the world and also test cricket for Australia, just the one team, obviously 11, maybe 12 guys in that at one time. Uh, what does the mm. future hold for you in terms of dreams and goals? <sighs> Um, I try not to get too far ahead of myself with that. Um, yeah, for me, it's about trying to get better and, and playing, you know, really well when I, whichever game I'm playing, you know, next, um, that's as simple as it is. You get too far ahead of yourself and, you know, it just doesn't work out in this game. This game bites you pretty quick. So you just try and stay present, um, focus on each game that's coming. And obviously in the back of the mind, you want to play for Australia, you wouldn't be here playing for Queensland you know, one level below if you didn't want to get to the next level. So that's obviously the goal. Um, I'd love to play overseas. I'd love to play, you know, T20 cricket in different leagues overseas or county four-day cricket in in England. Um, so I'd love to have all those different opportunities. But for me, you know, the better I play for Queensland and, and the Brisbane Heat, you know, first and foremost, that's, you know, where I'm contracted to uh, what's what I'm contracted to do. But if I do that, I'm sure I'll have opportunities to go elsewhere and expand my game and go overseas and play. Yeah. Uh, take care of itself. If you do the best you can. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right I hope so. Yeah. Well, really appreciated your time tonight, James. Just one Pleasure, last mate. thing that we ask all our guests at the end of uh, our conversation is we ask them, so you're in the public eye. You've got a lot of people looking at you. A lot of people will know who you are. They will, they'll watch you on the field. They'll, they'll see you. How does James Baisley want to be remembered? Oh, um, jeez. Oh, Jace, nice one, mate. <laughs> Say that for last, you reckon? Um, mate, I, how, I, how would I like to be remembered? I think, oh, I guess you, you remembered... I like to be remembered on the field as, you know, a match winner, uh, you know, a competitor, someone who plays the game hard and fair, um, a great team man, a great teammate, um, you know, off the field, I want to be, you know, I want to be known as, you know, humble, um, you know, selfless. Um, and I guess a lot of other things as well in terms of, of that public eye, they're probably the main ones is, is you know, being humble and selfless and um, willing to, I guess, you know, give everyone the time of day and, and et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to those kind of things, if that makes sense, yeah. um, you know, on the field, you want to be known as, I want to be known as, you know, someone who plays like really competitively, um, a great team man, you know, a real fighter, I guess. And, someone who can generally, you know, win matches and take games away from, from teams. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I know you a little bit. I'm, I'm not, um, I don't know you really, really well, but I can certainly say that from what I know of you, you certainly are a humble guy. You've been very generous with your time here and I've seen you interacting with Thanks, fans mate. at heat games. You've, you, you certainly do give back to the fans and um, yeah, I really appreciate that about you and i want to thank you again for coming on the press toward the goal podcast no no worries jason i appreciate the the kind words mate and i look forward to seeing the, the podcast kick off um get around some some athletes that you you're going to have on so i look forward to following your progress mate yeah perfect you listen in the car you said on going to and from training, yeah so i'll expect yeah to hear. there's always time no, yeah. there's always time so just add it add add this one to the list now and cycle it through Good Beautiful. man. Thanks, James. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the Pleasure, show. Man. No.